The sun is shining. It feels like spring in the Northeast. Welcome in, everybody, to It's Official. It's always shining in Southern California where Jeff Siegel's at, so he always looks happy. I'm, I'm just getting out of the winter doldrums here. So welcome to the show, Jeff. Should be a great one as we get into the thick of spring with the Triple Crown preps last weekend. 86 degrees tomorrow. Uh, it was only 61 yesterday, but uh, someone told Mother Nature to, you know, get off of behind and, and, and switch over, change the calendar already. So I think we're going to be nice and warm. But it never gets, even if it gets warm here, it's never humid. So you, it's something you can deal with. And uh, looking forward to that. No racing this weekend at Santa Anita. Right. I'll take a week off in, uh, after the, uh, the winter spring meeting, and we'll start back uh, the following uh, week from Friday. But that doesn't mean we still don't have good racing to talk about mm -hmm. and to look back on. I mean, and Keelan to me is just, God, I mean, it's just great racing and great competitive uh, fields, big fields. Um, never know when you're going to see the next star show up. So we've got uh, some important racing there. But again, we had some important racing last week, which definitely impacted the, the starting lineup for the Kentucky Derby. It's 68 here, and I feel like I hit the pick hey. six. So 86 would just be laying it on too thick, uh, uh, too much for me to handle at this point. We welcome you into the podcast where we tackle five hot topics each and every week. For those of you watching on our traditional podcast channels, we'll review the topics for you. For those of you listening along on our audio channels, let's get started on the big board this week. Our first of five topics don't you forget about me? The simple minds tell you that. And fierceness dominated the Florida Derby two weeks ago. So did we have Sierra Leone replaced at the top of the three-year-old division? Well, he said, don't forget about me after the bluegrass stakes. He was awfully impressive. Well, top Connor, the leader. Top Connor leads a length and a half. Just a touch is second by a length to Epic Ride, who's third a half length. Doorknock is still there and fourth to the inside. And BU is in fifth and still seven lengths off the lead. Now Sierra Leone is toward the center of the pack, looking toward the outside. Eight lengths to make up. Just over a quarter mile to go. Top Connor is the leader. Epic Ride swings wide. Just a touch between horses. Doorknock has to shift lanes along with Sierra Leone. That pair out in the center of the track, still five lengths off the lead as they move by the eighth pole. Just a touch has taken the lead from Top Connor. Sierra Leone is running on from the outside. A 16th to go. Sierra Leone comes forward for the lead and deep stretch and wins the Toyota Bluegrass for Tyler Gaffalione. Just a touch was second. Epic ride was third. One minute, 50.08 seconds. So, Jeff, now the state set we've got a dominant florida derby winner we've got a locomotive rallying to win the bluegrass stakes your take on what we saw in lexington i was impressed i i thought he might be vulnerable in this race because i i absolutely like just a touch and i thought the discrepancy in the tactical speed between the two horses could play out and it looked like it was going to in the upper mm -hmm. stretch just a touch had just secured a, a great pace stalking trip even though the fractions were quick he hit the front uh, Sierra Leone had to come from way out of it from the far outside, and boy, did he impress in the final stages. He wasn't really knocked about at all. He did what he had to do. Mm -hmm. That's what a $2.3 million yearling by Gunrunner is supposed to perform. Not right. a lot of them don't, but this Colt has upheld his end of the bargain. He's now run four times, four times, three wins in a second. His second was the nose defeat that he got in the Remsen, uh, right. which is not bad. Turned the tables on Doorknock. And he gives every indication that two things. Number one, he's going to step forward again. He's mm -hmm. got more to give. And that he will like a mile and a quarter. Now, I don't know about the the race shape and all that other thing that might happen in Kentucky. But after Fierceness won his last prep, I didn't think we were going to have a real true competitor. But don't you forget about me. That's the simple minds. We are simple minds. Let's face it. Right. And uh, Sierra Leone said, don't for you forget about me. I'm still around here. You know, I'm right. still standing. And uh, he came about uh, in this victory that, that indicated that you're going to have to worry about him on the first Saturday in May. We worried about him a little bit going into the starting gate or not going into the starting gate. He was reluctant to load with the outside post draw there at Keeneland, starting in front of the big crowd. It's not going to get any easier at Churchill Downs in that regard. You have that long walkover. They circle up in the chute forever. Then the long walkover, the long paddock time. 
Uh, they're going to load on the front side at the top of the stretch for the mile and a quarter with a lot of people around you. So it's going to be interesting to watch this horse school during the week, go to the gate a couple times, I'm sure. Chad's going to do what he can uh, to get Sierra Leone's mind right in this particular case. But, man, when it comes to his determination, it's, uh, you know, you said, don't you forget about me. It might be one way or another, the Blondie song. He's going to get you, get you, get you. He just keeps coming, right? I mean, he just keeps coming. And when you look at a horse who's got three straight mile and an eighth races on the resume going into the Kentucky Derby, I can't remember it. I can't remember it. I've got past performances going back to like 1919. Between now and the Derby, I'm going to go back and try to find the last horse who had three straight mile and an eighth races leading into the Kentucky Derby. Not just three straight mile and an eighth, but like you said, two wins, and he's a nose away from sweeping all three of those. That's a historic resume. In this day and age where lightly race horses tend to be, you know, what we're used to seeing, it's hard to say you have a historic resume when you've already run four times, but three mile and an eighth races of all the horses that have run in the Derby in the last 15, 20 years, he's probably the one you are not worried about the distance about the least. Not only that, but uh, I think that sometimes when you have hard races, you, you worry about, okay, he really had a hard last prep. Maybe he'll go back. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that was that hard of a prep for him. I mean, he, he did mm -hmm. what he had to do. Not only that, but, He's one horse you really do not have to worry about weather. He can handle sloppy tracks. He sure. can handle fast ground. You don't have to worry about the weather report him. Yeah. Here, the only thing you may have to worry about is you'd like for him to get an outside draw just so he can kind of drop over and pick his spot. Agreed. You'd like to see some speed materialize. But the more I look at this race, I'm not saying they're going to go out in 45, but they're not going to be crawling either. At least I don't think they mm -hmm. will. So he should have enough pace to uh, set things up if he's good enough. And I, I think Sierra Leone, to me, uh, you know, if he behaves himself, as you mentioned, uh, in the warm-ups and going into the gate, um, I he's genuine. He's going to fire, and he's going to make it interesting from the quarter pull home. He has that tendency to duck in a little bit. He did it again in the bluegrass. He's a paddler. He's not the – for $2.3 million, he doesn't have the most efficient moving, but – He's a runner, right? And I don't know how long he'll stay sound with that front left action that he has, but look, they're trying to win a Kentucky Derby with him. And Chad Brown has said, you know, I've won the Preakness. I've won all the big races around the country. The one thing missing in my resume is the Kentucky Derby, and he feels a little more intent, I think, on having a Derby horse now than he had in his career. I think it's a focus for him now, and, and he's got the right horse this time around. You mentioned, like, now we have two horses, right? We thought we were just going to have that one dominant favorite into the Derby. The last time we had just two horses like this in the Derby was 2016 when it was Nyquist and Exaggerator. Five to one and everybody else double digits in the field. And of course, Nyquist was the two-year-old champion, won the Florida Derby. This year, we've got the two-year-old champion who won the Florida Derby, who's going to be favored in fierceness. And the very clear-cut second choice in the role of Exaggerator from off the pace is Sierra Leone. Of course, they ran one-two at Church Downs, and then the winner got, you know, the revenge got on him when Exaggerator won the Preakness in the swap. And like you said, I mean, you could just see this playing out. You could see a fierceness derby, a Sierra Leone Preakness, and it's 2016 all over again. The stars are aligning for something like that. No, no question. I, I, I'm, and I think that maybe Sierra Leone may not be or may not receive the backing that maybe he deserves because there's going to be a rather significant discrepancy in the buyer speed figures. Yeah. Yeah. And the people are going to say, well, I, I like Sierra Leone, but I don't know. I mean, the other horse is so much faster. How do I make Sierra Leone close the gap? Or am I just hoping that um, you know, the favorite, the other favorite is going to be, uh, you know, going to back up and, and, and bounce or whatever, or turn in a bad effort, which he's been known to do. So, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's not necessarily a two horse race, but I do think those are the two that are going to separate themselves from the others in terms of the tote. And then it's up to you to maybe pick a long shot to try to beat both of them. Right. Absolutely. And where do we find those long shots? Well, we had a couple more preps last weekend, including the wood Memorial. Can you feel the resilience? Well, this horse needed a bounce back effort after doing the dirty work in the risen star stakes, chasing the lone speed track phantom resilience got away from that very tough risen star where it was Sierra Leone track phantom, Louisiana Derby catching freedom. He got a little easier company in New York and he took full advantage of it for trainer Bill Mott. It was resilience winning the wood Memorial. 
They've got to catch the big long shots. Evening News and Lonesome Boy, who's under a drive. Here comes Resilience moving in closer. Deterministic will need somewhere to go. Deposition is in the hunt. Society Man, Orange Cap is splitting rivals. Uncle Heavy, Tuscan Sky, protective from the back of the field. They're all making a charge for the lead. Lonesome Boy will have the lead here with Resilience, and now Resilience presses on, and Resilience is quickly up by two, three widening lengths. Society Man is in the clear. Oh, we had a spill there. Deposition clipped heels and went down. It was Resilience whose opening up is up by two and a half, three lengths. Society Man down towards the inside. Protective. Resilience is drifting out. It's Resilience who's clear is up by three lengths now. Resilience will win the wood. Society Man second. Protective Lonesome Boy is going to finish fourth. So it is Resilience heading to Churchill Downs. Maybe one of the top five, six wagering choices. Now when we get on the tote board, we're looking for somebody else beyond the big two in here, Jeff. And and Resilience in this race, I thought he was a little underappreciated going into this one. I think out of it, people are going to respect him a little bit more. It was blinkers on in a change of tactics a little bit. He wasn't quite uh, as... Uh, right to the pace as he was in Louisiana. But again, that race in Louisiana, there was no race shape in there at all. Track Phantom had just come off a couple stakes wins. You were afraid he might get away on the front end again. So he had to track him. I thought this was a really professional performance. And John Velasquez gave up a complete day with six graded stakes races at Keeneland to ride essentially this horse. And there was not much on the undercard for Johnny V in New York. He was there to ride this horse, even though he rides fierceness his number one horse. So resilience is going to be looking for a new pilot. If fierceness makes the starting gate, obviously, but I was very impressed with this performance and this horse in general. I think he's one of the good ones in this crop. You really did like him a lot in this race and kudos to you. And he wasn't, it wasn't hard to predict that he would run well because the blinkers first time blinkers inside draw, the last time he had run on fast ground, he broke his maiden easily at Gulfstream Park, earned a solid number that day. In the Risen Star, he caught slop, which maybe he didn't like. And then mm -hmm. you look at his pedigree, buy into mischief and out of a smart strike mare. You, he's obviously a, a, a well-bred colt. And mm -hmm. the way he drew clear in that last race, and the ears were kind of up in the final 16th of a mile, I think he won with something left. Mm -hmm. And... If you like him or if you think you want to use him in the in the derby, uh, depending upon where he draws, the one thing that you can pretty much uh, lean on is that he's got very good tactical speed. He's going to – if he breaks, he's going to fold into a great second flight trip. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably won't have to move on him until the quarter pole. And then you find out how good he is. <laughs> there's no real reason for him not to continue his improving pattern. Does yeah. he have to make a quantum leap to beat fierceness? Probably. Sure, but he doesn't sure. have to make a quantum leap to hit the board. So no. if exactus and trifectas, he almost has to be on your ticket somewhere just because bread like he is, you just don't know where his improvement is going to level off. And I think he's ready to step forward again. You mentioned that damn side pedigree. He's out of the smart strike mare of Meadows Sweet. Who is she? She's half sister to Courageous Cat and another big time turf miler named Aftermarket. I mean, two grade one runners. The second dam, Tranquility Lake, who was a superstar on dirt and turf and could get a distance of ground. Those other two were turf milers, but grade one major millionaire types. So uh, just a brilliant family on the dam side by Into Mischief, one of the more brilliant sires in the game over the last decade. So there's a lot to like about resilience. Has to make up a lot to beat fierceness for sure. But this horse got beat three and a half lengths by Sierra Leone down at Fairgrounds. And so... That wasn't that far, and if you take a trip in the Kentucky Derby and, and Sierra Leone gets bottled up somewhere and this horse has more tactical speed, maybe, just maybe, at that, uh, you know, at the at the intersection of, of talent and trip, you can be in the mix. And I think resilience is one uh, that we want to keep an eye on. What about deterministic in here? Everything kind of imploded for this runner. Uh, it was a tough trip. The horse kind of, like, to me, on the clubhouse turn, got that oh crap moment where the turn came up on him. He was ranked. He started throwing his head on the first turn. He had never been around two turns before, mile and an eighth at Aqueduct. They come right into the clubhouse turn pretty much out of the gate, uh, you know, with a short run into that first turn. Nothing really seemed to go right for deterministic. Then he had traffic trouble on the second term and uh, turn. Ended up eighth in here. He's still got the points to be in the Kentucky Derby based on his Gotham win. What do you do if you're Christoph Clement and company with Determinist? I back off. I mean, someone must have yelled at this horse 
into the clubhouse turn, hey, you're by Liam's map out of a Spice Town, Mayor. <laughs> number one, you're not supposed to run this far. Number two, why don't you get rank like all of these sprinter stretching outs do? And I was that was the key to me. I, although I I love him as a horse, and I still think he's got a tremendous amount of natural talent. I wanted to see how he would react from the starting gate right. to the clubhouse turn, and I didn't get uh, I didn't take long for him to start. I said, okay, this is over. Yeah, he doesn't know he's supposed mm-hmm. to run two turns, and you know I think that the the speed breeding that he had in there kind of took over, and he got mad when they tried to grab him, and I saw that. And then mm-hmm. into the far turn when he thought maybe there's still something left, he got blocked, he got mad again, and right. then he flattened out. To me, it's not so much the distance of the race is that this colt didn't have any idea how to negotiate it. Yeah. And if I'm Christophe Clement, I say, okay, let's back off here. Let's mm-hmm. let's let there's still good races to the wood, maybe the Woody Stevens, maybe one of those kind of races like that. And maybe down the road when he gets a little bit more experience. We can test him again, but right now, if they ran him back in the Derby, I think they might ruin him. And I don't think Christoph Lamont yeah. ruined many horses. I would back yeah. off and, and start over. I, I I would agree. There's a great race watching point that I want to let people know. If you go back and watch replays on this, going into the clubhouse turn, deterministics about three paths off the rail, just behind the front couple horses, mm-hmm. and Joel Rosario sees the inside open, so he just guides the horse quickly to the left. But as soon as he did that, the horse took off. Yeah. Well, if you watch workouts in the morning, that's your sign to go, right? right. You're galloping along, you're galloping along, they bring you to the rail, and you're supposed to go. And exactly. this horse didn't have much experience at all other than in the morning, right? He had the one race at Saratoga last year. He had the Gotham. I think when Rosario took him to the rail, he goes, oh, I'm supposed to go now. He just didn't have enough race experience. Like you said, the talent is there, but he took off like a maniac as soon as Rosario guided him to the rail. And then he got in all kinds of, you know, headstrong trouble into the clubhouse turn. He had to go nine furlongs. This is a very talented horse, deterministic. But like you said, the Derby becomes even more of a popcorn popper in there for him to try to figure out what to do. No, uh, the experienced horses run into trouble in the Kentucky Derby, much less the inexperienced ones. You know, he didn't do this in the Gotham, but let's not forget in the Gotham, there was a half mile run from the starting point gate to the far turn. Right. This is an eighth of a mile. It's a whole different game yeah. uh, apart from just the distance himself. So I'm not going to give up on deterministic, but nope, I am nope. not going to consider him in any way, shape, or form as a uh, as a likely starter or should be a likely starter in the Kentucky Derby. Let's turn our attention now to our third topic and go to the West Coast where the Santa Anita Derby was on Saturday. Bob Baffert had the favorites in here in imagination. He had a long shot in Windstock. Stronghold was the one horse who maybe could get into the Kentucky Derby if he put it all together. His race in the Sunland Derby had him kind of on the threshold of being a Kentucky Derby horse. How would he respond? Looked in the eye with the favorite imagination? Well, we got ourselves quite a show on Saturday at the Great Race Place. Let's go back to Frank Miramati's call. Heading to the 3 8 pole, Tapolo, imagination yet to be called on a length and a half back second. Stronghold awaiting racing room. He's just inside. EJ won the cup. Then Curlin's Chaos, Windstock, another three to Tetsudo and McVay. Imagination making his move past the quarter pole. EJ won the cup, running a good race on the outside. Tapolo is down at the rail, and Stronghold won from the outside. A driving finish. Stronghold burst through between horses and is up to take the lead at the furlong pole. Imagination trying to match strides with him, and EJ won the cup in third. It's Imagination and Stronghold knows and knows in the Santa Anita Derby. Stronghold chest in front, and Stronghold prevails under Antonio Fraysu, who's jubilant, understandably, in this great moment, defeating imagination. EJ won the cup was third. I guess if you win eight Santa Anita derbies, losing one like that just gets you a snap of the fingers uh, uh, for Bob, but stronghold we just talked about the experience of horses in the morning and how that can translate to the afternoon jeff you showed a workout with him and company with two superstar turf horses where he had almost the same kind of trip where he let them go he had to come he had to split and he just finished up so beautifully that's what put you onto this horse i think uh to win this race and you were on top of stronghold in this particular spot uh like morning like afternoon he really uh learned his lessons and came through nicely that's exactly what it was i I had watched his race in the Sunland Derby. I thought it was really good. It actually earned a pretty good number, so it was not some phony race. Mm-hmm. I loved the way he did it. 
Um, but again, you're talking about the Sunland Derby. So now he comes out for Phil D'Amato, and he has a spectacular workout, which we highlighted last Friday, in which he's not only did he blow by two really good horses, he did it easily, he did it in hand, and he did it the right way. Mm -hmm. He didn't pull, he didn't lug in, he didn't do anything stupid. He just looked like a horse who had been there and done that, which he had. And mm -hmm. so now he comes out of that race, he gets himself into a jackpot at the 516th pole, where he's between horses, I mean, he's behind the wall. He has to come between horses because um, one of the horses hung around a lot longer than I think we thought he would. EJ won the cup with on the yeah. outside. He's supposed to back out of there. He didn't. So right. now Stronghold has got to come through a rather narrow opening, which he responded professionally. He's going to have to do that in Kentucky, I'm sure. And then he beats Imagination, who was coming off a win in the San Felipe, a race in which he earned a 96 buyer number, and in a race in which he battled bravely and won that race. That's a tough, seasoned, talented, fast horse that Stronghold had to look in the eye and go on by, and he did it. I don't know if Stronghold has a natural talent, natural ability, again, to go out and beat Fierceness and, and Sierra mm -hmm. Leone. But there's one thing I know about Stronghold, and he showed that me in, in his races and in his workouts. He wants to come get you. He wants mm -hmm. to beat you. He's not going to back down from a fight. And another thing I'll tell you about is that they gave him, they, the buyer guys, gave her an 89, gave him an 89 buyer number. That's ridiculous. That's at <laughs> least five points too short. Um, I looked at his races. Imagination just beat, just won a race at this track and distance by 96, earned a 96 number. Do you think he regressed? I don't think so. I no. think he is the best shot. And Stronghold just earned an 89 buyer winning in Sunland Park. You don't think he ran better in this race in Sunland right. Park? Come on, you know, get it, get it right. Uh, I thought he at least earned a, a mid 90s and didn't do it with a great trip. So um, I don't know. I mean, uh, you can always go back and and fix it. I guess as much as they did with Sierra <laughs> Leone last week. I think there should be a little bit of a fix, a fixer uh, maneuver here with Stronghold because he's better than the 89. And if you want to consider him for Santa Anita, I'm sorry, for the Kentucky Derby, consider that that number, if you look at it, is not mm -hmm. real. I mean, he's better than that, and I think he's going to show it. Again, he's not quite up to what he needs to be to win it, but I right. would be very, very surprised if he doesn't at least hit the board. A tough race a race where he had to lay his belly down to win it in the stretch, how a horse comes out of that kind of race. Sometimes it galvanizes him. Sometimes it knocks the starch out of him. Stronghold will be a horse you definitely want to watch in the workouts between now and then you'll get a chance to see him work probably at Santa Anita once or twice. And then maybe once over the track at Churchill Downs. Uh, we know he can run at Churchill Downs. He won probably the best maiden race in America last year at Churchill Downs when he beat the uh, track Phantom and he beat Resilience. So, the Santa Anita Derby, the Wood Memorial uh, winner, and the uh, what the Lecompte winner, I believe, was Track Phantom. So uh, three major stakes winners who were all headed to the Kentucky Derby came out of the same maiden race back, I believe, October it was uh, at Churchill Downs. So we know he can handle Churchill in the fall. Don't always believe that horses who run well at Churchill in the fall run well at Churchill in the spring. It's a little different track the way it's maintained. Uh, it's definitely tighter in the spring for the Derby week than it is in the fall where it's looser and cuppier. So it's not always an apples to apples comparison, but it doesn't hurt that he's got that race at Churchill Downs on his resume. may not be a big boost to him, but it certainly doesn't hurt when you look at Stronghold. And also, too, I want to mention. Frankie Dottori, what a day at Santa Anita on Saturday. Six winners. He won six in a row on the card. He was the one on Imagination. How in the hell do you get by Frankie Dottori? Antonio Frazou, thumbs up, because you would just assume at that point Frankie's going to will his horse to the wire. We can argue all we want at how much a jockey's worth, but in a neck-and-neck -neck race like that with Frankie winning six on the card, you would have bet your bank that he was going to find a way. Imagination is a good horse. I mean, he's not, you know, nice or anything like that, but he's certainly as good as he's almost as good as Muth, I would think. And and, yeah. and Muth went to Arkansas and won. So, but the problem with Imagination, he he started out with his buyer numbers, and, and the first three races were in his seventies. So they're not going to give him any credit anymore. Right. He's going to be stuck with that stigma for a while, which kind of brings down Stronghold. The one thing about Stronghold is, though, and this is what I love, uh, in addition to the fact that he looks like he's capable of, of laying fairly close if needed uh, to get a good trip, he has run and run well, second at Ellis Park in his debut, the Churchill Downs win that you mentioned, 
Then he was second to Nysos in the Bob Hope at Del Mar. Then he was second beat the half <laughs> length in the Los Salamitos uh, fraternity at Los Sal. He goes to Sunland and wins down here. Comes to Santa Anita in his first start at Santa Anita, even though he's been training here, wins. I yeah. mean, this is a horse that that's how six, genuine six he track is. six races. It's a genuine, genuine, yeah. and consistent and reliable and tactical. He's by Ghost Sapper. I mentioned how. I mean, can you can you remember the last good Ghost Sapper colt that ever existed as a two year old? They all get better. This horse hasn't even scratched the surface. So I I, I am just over the moon with his genuine being his you know the genuine and consistent form he has, but he still has to go out and do better. And who knows? Right. Maybe he's got it in him. Let's continue our topics here this week and continue to talk about the Triple Crown because we are knee-deep in that time of year. Our Triple Crown tracker each week gives you a chance maybe to look ahead, to discuss some of the topics, our rankings, and the bubble is now under consideration. We will go to Kaylin to discuss the Lexington Stakes, the final points prep in just a moment. But, Jeff, let's take our uh, bracketology, if you will, right? They just played the NCAA championship game last night. Congrats to UConn taking down Purdue last evening. But uh, now you get to be Jerry Palm. I get to be Joey Brackets here. Uh, let's do a little bracketology, if you will, for the Kentucky Derby starting gate. We'll call this gateology because I couldn't come up with a better name for it. But here's how it stands as of right now, the final five horses in the starting gate by points would be Catalytic, Deterministic, Society Man, Mystic Dan, and No More Time. Now, the 20th horse listed on the list is T.O. Password from Japan. He is in because he qualifies automatically as the highest point getter out of the Japan road to the Kentucky Derby. So 45 points is the threshold to get into the Kentucky Derby right now, which is high, very high for what we're used to seeing. And I thought it would be low this year with Baffert taking 200 and some points out of uh, various races this year that, that his horse is qualified for. So 45 is what you need to get in. Now, the first five horses on the list who are below that in terms of points, Grand Mo the first, Common Defense, Epic Ride, Hades, who we're going to see again this week, and Uncle Heavy. So Uncle Heavy just coming out of the Wood Memorial where he was disappointing, couldn't follow up on his Withers win. Now, this weekend, we have the Lexington Stakes. 20 points to the winner, then 10 6 4 2. Pretty much beyond this, the 10, nothing's going to help anybody. First or second out of the Lexington could help a handful of horses. Hades, that we talked about right now, 24th on the list. Uh, if he wins, he gets up to 50, and he's in the field. If Hades runs second, he gets up to 40, and now he's going to need a little bit of help. He's going to need a defection or two to get into the race. Same with Encino, Liberal Arts. They need to win to maybe even be in the consideration. Horses like Lucky Jeremy, the Wine Steward, have some points, but they're not going to get into the Kentucky Derby if the field overfills with more than 20 starters, regardless what happens uh, in the Lexington for those two runners. So it's Hades and Encino in the Lexington, Jeff, who have a chance really to make a statement on points. Now, I think that we can pretty much, as you pointed out on the lower part of that graphic, that deterministic will bail i don't think i'm, I'm thinking that endlessly might remain in the field i, I think he's going to work well mm -hmm. enough at Churchill to uh to encourage his his uh connections to go especially his style of running where you know he's not going to get himself worn out uh chasing uh, uh whatever speed may exist he'll lay back he'll run from the quarter pole to the wire and if if the you know it, it could feel the field could collapse i expect him to stay in um mm -hmm. but everybody else to me uh looks like in that last five and other than deterministic uh and and i think they'll they'll stay now what you have to brace yourself for is the ones the defections that don't want to come out that right. get injured or get sick or or turn up sore or something right. then you're waiting in the wings you know and yeah. uh, that we saw a lot two years ago that could go as long as friday but the day before yes. the derby you know so when rich strike got in and nobody even knew mm -hmm. who he was and he got in <laughs> so i mean to me uh these guys who want to get in and they look like they can't get in there's there's still some faith there some hope that uh things might break their way and some of those horses that aren't in the Derby list right now have talent. I mean, we're going to talk about this Lexington Stakes in a moment. Uh, 
Hades won the Holy Bull Stakes, right? And he was one of the ones for the Florida Derby, but didn't turn up well that day. Had a little bit of trouble early in the race and just didn't fire. Encino drew the outside post in the Bluegrass last week, and they decided to pull out of there, Brad Cox, and, and head to the Lexington instead. Uh, Liberal Arts, a horse who I've been very high on, he had a nightmarish trip, a lot of it his own doing. He lost it on the first turn right. uh, in the clubhouse turn when getting into a wrestling match with Tyler Gaffleone. He's back in the Lexington Stakes now with a chance to get in on some quality points, maybe for the Preakness. Liberal Arts, I still think, could be a Kentucky Derby horse, but he's going to need to win the Lexington and need another horse or two at least to drop out of the Kentucky Derby, which in the next four weeks is going to happen. I mean, just mathematically, we know that. Uh, that is just history. I mean, it would be an exceptional year if the top 20 holds over the next three, four weeks. It just doesn't work out that way. There are also also eligibles that can go into the Kentucky Derby, like you mentioned with Rich Strike. So even if you're not all the way up to 20, but you're there at Churchill, you're on the grounds, you get your name in the entry box. They enter the Saturday before. That's another factor. They're now entering on Saturday for the Kentucky Derby, a full week out. So there's time for horses to drop along the way. But again, you'll want you're going to get all the also eligibles are going to take a shot, especially when entries are on Saturday and scratch time is Friday, the beginning of the card on Oaks Day. So there's a lot of chance for horses to come out after the entries are drawn. So you're going to get all four also eligibles enter this year. I think you're going to see 24. And then there is the status of Muth. Uh, thanks to a temporary mm. injunction that was filed, uh, Kentucky Circuit Court judge uh, uh, will uh, determine whether or not to uh, issue that. Yeah. I can just, I had this vision in my head. I don't know what it's like, like the, the, the judge looking over the form and saying, well, yeah, he's got a shot, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, I'm, you know, looking at, hmm, well, maybe I, maybe, yeah, maybe I will throw him in, you know, I don't yeah. know. But uh, but that's another horse that, that could spoil the party for some. I don't know what kind of chance that is when it gets to the legal legalese and court filings and stuff. I'm out out to lunch, but yeah. it's something we'll certainly read about. But anyway, yeah. Uh, well, with Moot, the, the decision should come on the fifteenth. They're going to have another hearing on the fifteenth, which is a, a week from yesterday, right? Uh, right. And we're going to see on the fifteenth, uh, Churchill's trying to get something thrown out. Uh, uh, they're trying to get an injunction. They're trying to get the injunction thrown out. They might do the hearings together, the judge has said. Uh, I saw a quote from the judge. His name Mitch Perry. And, and I love this quote. He said, I don't want a circus. Well, Judge Perry, the clowns are out. They've got the flowers in their pocket and they're squirting water. We already have a circus with this. Right. It's been a circus for three years. So uh, what his decision is going to be on whether or not they can, uh, that Zidane can run uh booth in the kentucky derby would have major implications because when you think about this if they were to reverse course now and say well you have the points to go what about all the other horses who thought okay i need to do this i need to do that i've planned my horse i got the points that i needed all season long somebody's coming out at the expense then who played by what the published rules were the whole season so there's not an easy solution to this and if it's you know, I don't know what the legal ease will be, like you say, uh, as to what is fair and what is not fair, but the world and life are not fair. Um, I I can't see. I mean, look, I, we're handicappers and we're gamblers. I can't see this lawsuit working. I can't. I, I will be shocked if it works and that they allow move to run the Kentucky Derby. Um I'll be very surprised. I, well, I think it's a long shot. It's a Hail Mary at the last minute. And I, you know, I don't, you know, like, look, if you, if you're in that situation and you want to take every last hope that you can, and you've got the money to do it and, and you want to take a shot. Great. But man, I don't know. I'm bad on stewards calls though. I, I get most of the DQs wrong. So uh, maybe I'll be wrong on this one, but I do know this, it will be a circus one way or the other. Yeah, right. It will be a circus and I don't know what's going to happen. And fortunately I don't have to worry about it. And, and, <laughs> and so whatever happens, happens, let them you know, you talk about a circus. I mean, I first thing, okay, what's the elephant in the room then? If this is a circus, you know, <laughs> yeah. right? I don't know. I mean, there's all these kind of puns we can play with, but other than that, and it gives us something to talk about. Uh, mm -hmm. Let them let them figure it out. So, uh, well, you know, we'll uh, we'll worry about that if it happens. Here's my updated uh, uh, rankings for the Countdown to the Crown, which is published each Friday at CountdownToTheCrown.com. Uh, I've backed to twenty this week. We kind of had a mishmash last week because I've decided now. 
after all the preps are done, we've got the race in the Lexington this weekend. It's time to talk Derby horses only. So we paired out the horses ineligible for the Kentucky Derby, kind of threw them off onto the right side. Some Preakness horses, Muth, Tuscan Gold's aiming that way. Epic Ride coming out of uh, the Bluegrass Stakes, probably a horse for the Preakness. Imagination, maybe Knightsbridge. He could work his way into the Preakness after the Pat Day Mile. He's going to run in there. So we're going to keep those horses off to the side because they are not Kentucky Derby points horses and ready to go. I've got to turn Deterministic listed last because I think he comes out of the race, as Jeff and I uh, have speculated. Now, Jeff, as I get to the rankings, resilience moved up. You know, he's been top 12, 13 for me since the very beginning of the season and continues to move up. And, and I thought his race in the wood puts him ahead of all the other domestic horses, not named Fierceness or Sierra Leone. I had a debate whether or not I like him more than Forever Young, the horse from Japan who won in the UAE. I think he's slightly better than Catching Freedom now, even though those two matched up within about a length of each other in the Risen Star. I like where Sierra Leone is going now towards the mile and a quarter, just slightly more than Catching Freedom. Beyond that, I'm starting to get a little worried who I'm going to use beyond those top four or five because, you know, the Kentucky Derby's not going to run, you know, chalk top to bottom. So we've got time to figure out who some long shots might be. What do you think of the order or how you might shift things around? I think the top, top eight to me is where I'm focused on. I think mm -hmm. any of those would be capable of um, – hitting the board at least, you know, mm -hmm. I, I like, I, I I'm very confident that stronghold will run his best race. I'm intrigued by endlessly, although I could see him, you know, not fired because it is dirt and it is dirt in his face and all that other stuff. But I think the top eight here have a legitimate reason to run well, just a touch. I'm a little concerned about his lack of seasoning. I thought he ran mm -hmm. really well in the bluegrass, but I also thought he had his chance. Um, right. Catching freedom comes from way out of it, uh, similar, I guess, to uh, um, Endlessly, and we'll see how he performs. Uh, Resilience has got the great tactical speed, so I think he'll run well. Um, and then you got the big two. So uh, it's kind of shaping up like we kind of expected. Most mm -hmm. of the experts uh, kind of got the NCAA tournament bracket uh, right, uh, at least when it comes <laughs> to the Final Four. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not really expecting – any massive surprise here other than among who might be on your top eight here. I think that's, that's the race. Everybody else I've got a little bit of a negative again uh, against. And so uh, I think the, uh, the top eight is where it's at. If there is an NC state to use a 2024 bracket analogy Encino or liberal arts this weekend, I think if either runs big and gets into the Kentucky Derby field, they might be up in that eight area. I don't think any of them move higher than that, but they're in that eight, nine area. I, I like those horses as much as I like just the or track phantom or anybody from nine below. So uh, those would be some interesting horses. Let's go to our fifth and final topic this week is we're always looking for a star of tomorrow on this podcast. Jeff took us to the turf at Santa Anita on closing weekend of the classic meet. Bits Tiger Magic. Check this one out. The trailer is Pipa Philippa and the leader Bits Tiger Magic pouring it on. Jane Kende starts to pick up momentum. Just bobbled very awkwardly in mid stretch, but it's all Bits Tiger Magic lights out. She has devastated the competition here. Bits Tiger Magic by eight lengths. All right, Jeff, tell us about this one for Peter Miller. Second time starter by Smiling Tiger. This is a cowbird race. I'm not expecting her to go out, you know, and win a graded stakes in New York or anything mm -hmm. like that. But um, I think because she's a regional uh, star, I think, she, and because she's a cowbird, I think she's got a chance to, you know, be a poor man's the chosen brawn or something <laughs> like that. I don't know. Um, but, I mean, she's very fast. I, I was intrigued by the comments that Peter Miller said uh, uh, on our simulcast show prior to this race. Uh, and that he's, he said um, that he didn't think she needed the lead to win. And clearly that was a, a statement uh, born out of what he had seen in the morning from her. And she actually made the lead here because she's just flat out quicker than everybody else. Right. But again, she was, she was really switched off. I was really impressed with the way she, you know, relaxed and then was chirped to and opened up and won by seven. Um, she, um, she went 44, three to the half finished out in one Oh eight and four, never really knocked about at any stage of the race. Um, both of her races were good. Her first race was on dirt. She ran second that day, worn down by a filly who came out 
the same day or the day before and won a, a hundred thousand dollar stakes kind of franking that form so you didn't have to worry about the strength of the race that she just finished second in. and she cut out wicked fractions that day she comes back here she was knocked down to six to five she was like two to one most of the wagering i'm saying mm -hmm. what's going on here anyway she wins off by herself and now because she's a cowbred and because she can run on dirt or turf and because mm -hmm. peter thinks that maybe even though she's bred to be quick uh you know, maybe she could go a mile down the road. I think there's a chance that Bits Tiger Magic, as fast as she is on figs, um, could you know reel off a bunch of races here. And you know the cowbreds are featured at Del Mar, so there's a lot to look forward mm -hmm. to. Bits Tiger Magic and cowbred races here in California. Put her on your horses to watch list. It's our star of tomorrow for this week. We've got a bonus topic for you this week. Late last night, the Senate and the House and the state of Maryland approved the bill that will move the operations for the racing at Pimlico Racetrack and the restoration of the Pimlico facility into the hands of the Maryland uh, Racing Authority. Uh, so we are going to see a transition between First Racing and the Maryland Thoroughbred Racing Operations Authority uh, beginning July 1st at the uh, as soon as the governor Hogan in Maryland signs the bill, which he's expected to do, uh, there's going to be a change of hands and things are going to get a little, um, uh, I don't know, cloudy, I guess, over the, the next few years, because at uh, Pimlico, they will run the Preakness Stakes there, of course, in May. And, and then in July 1st, uh, the Maryland uh, new authority will take over the operations of the day to day racing in Maryland. Stronic Group and First Racing will still own Laurel Park, and they will run at Laurel Park for the rest of 2024. Of course, all winter into 2025. Preakness 2025 now is expected back at Pimlico. There were talks about two Preaknesses moving to Laurel Park, but as of last night, the reporting uh, from the media in Maryland is Preakness 2025 would be at Pimlico. Uh, and that would be the 150th running of the Pimlico uh, of the Preakness Stakes at Pimlico. And then you expect them to raise the building immediately because then 2026 will go to Laurel Park. And the 2027 Preakness will be where the new Pimlico race course would be unveiled. So a lot of exciting times in Maryland. It could be a win-win for everyone involved. Uh, not for the taxpayers in the state of Maryland, who anytime the politicians get involved, I think three, four hundred million dollars involved in this project for the state uh, to rebuild Pimlico. The taxpayers are obviously going to foot a lot of the bill in that case. But from a racing fan standpoint, Jeff, this feels like it could be a win win for everyone involved. The horsemen in Maryland want to run their own operation, similar to the way the state of California runs Del Mar racing. And that's what we're probably looking at for the future of Maryland. I think it's a good thing. I, I mean, a brand new racetrack, um, uh, the racetrack that uh, my hero in this industry, Andrew Beyer, once called a dump, you know, <laughs> and I really couldn't <laughs> disagree with him. Uh, but if we, we get a brand new um, um, uh, racetrack there, I, I think there's enough purse money in Maryland and I think there's enough at non circuit to have a viable circuit, you know, and I do mm -hmm. just like Del Mar has always been. Del Mar always trailed. Santa Anita and Hollywood Park uh, uh, in terms of handle and everything else until such time as they got their act together down there. And we're talking like a good 40 years now. But still, mm -hmm. I think there's a possibility that Maryland thrives under these uh, circumstances. Wish them the best. And it gives uh, a lot of breeders the opportunity, maybe if they have to bypass New York, maybe they don't have the stock that uh, uh, acts there. Uh, I think they will find Maryland racing to be a uh, uh, a good thing and uh, so looking forward to that looking forward to a brand new track that can't wait to see in a couple of years and see how they they have it and uh, move on and uh, hopefully everything will work out just great and if you're nostalgic and you want to go back to the old hilltop you got another shot this year and maybe a shot in uh, 2025 as well but again that's the latest reporting i've seen it both ways that 25 and 26 would be to laurel but last night, the reporting is 2025 will be at Pimlico. So uh, don't wait. Don't wait. If you want to get to Pimlico, make sure you get there this spring uh, during the short Preakness meet uh, to check out Old Hilltop at least one more time. But new Old Hilltop should be awfully, awfully yeah. impressive. I, I've seen some renderings of, of what they're planning there. I've seen the renderings at Belmont Park. Very exciting times for the Triple Crown venues. Churchill Downs with that brand new Coliseum paddock that they've put in there. Uh, you think about what 2027 is going to look like in the yeah. Triple Crown, and yeah. it's 
going to look night and day from what the facilities look like, uh, what we see here in, you know, 2023 last year, yeah. which uh, is the last at Belmont because Belmont, of course, will not be hosting the Belmont Stakes this year. It goes to Saratoga. So exciting times, a lot of transition going on. And when I say it's kind of cloudy, we're just kind of, we're going to figure it out, right? I mean, we're not going to, we're going to say, what, there's a Belmont Stakes at a mile and a quarter. There's a, at Saratoga, there's a, a Preakness at Laurel. I mean, it's just, it's going to be different for a couple of years, but it's going to be good on the back end, Doug, hopefully. It will be. And you mentioned Belmont and, and uh, the drawings we've seen of that uh, uh, track, that what it's going to look like, uh, you know, the latter half of this uh, decade. It. Uh, I'm jealous out here in California. I mean, uh, I love Santa Anita, but uh, change is always good as far as I'm concerned and improvement's always good. So we'll look forward to that. But anyway, good racing this weekend. Uh, still uh, things to uh, develop. And just, again, I say this every week, or every year, God, I hope there's no late defections. Nothing could be mm -hmm. worse than being an owner with the hopes and dreams of being in the Kentucky Derby and then and getting that that phone call. Nobody yeah. wants to. Well, imagine you know, imagine being Mike Rapoli, right? He had it with yeah. Uncle Mo. He had it last year with Forte. Uh, I've made light of some of the the Rapoli Twitterisms, uh, you know, in in recent months or whatever like that, but. He has got to be literally jumping out of his skin for the first Saturday of May for the chance to run fierceness. And and for racing fans out there, for him specifically, everybody involved around the horse, but the fans of the game, we want to see the best horses. So, you know, let's hope that fierceness gets there and uh, puts out his best feet. And we see the best feet forward from Sierra Leone and all the potential upsetters. Because one thing we know about the Kentucky Derby is just when you think you know the answer, somebody changes the question, as the famous exactly. pro wrestler used to say. So uh, anything can happen, and we're looking forward to following it all over the next couple of weeks. He's Jeff Siegel. I'm Jeremy Plonk. We'll be back on Friday for the First Call podcast. And on the First Call podcast, we'll handicap eight stakes races for this weekend. Big ones at Keeneland. Friday at Keeneland, you've got Master of the Seas, last year's Breeders' Cup uh, dirt, uh, mile winner on the turf back in the uh, in the Maker's Mark mile. So a big weekend coming up at Keeneland. Jeff and I I'll preview it all on Friday. Have a great week, everyone.